This episode of Case Acquaint may contain content that is not appropriate for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Case Acquaint. You have found episode 15. Today, we're going to be covering one main case, but in so doing, we're also going to mention several other cases. There's a lot to talk about, and there's plenty of opportunity for you to help this family get the justice they've been seeking for over 30 years. This is the story of the murder of Ron Novak. In researching our stories, we usually start by reading dozens of newspaper articles, sometimes more than dozens, And we notice the details most journalists like to include, no matter if it happened 50 years ago or last year. For this case, it was no different. And the first thing we noticed that everybody seemed to open with was the weather. And usually when they talk about the weather, they use words like brisk, ominous, sunny, bright. But this case, there wasn't much to say besides how cold it was. On that evening in 1983, when 24-year-old Ron Novak was attacked in his own home. There isn't much to say besides what the temperature was, and that varies wildly from one report to another. Some said that with the wind chill, it would feel like 100 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. Others said it was more like only 40 below. We looked up the weather for that night, and... Indeed, the night of December 23rd, 1983, with the wind chill, was negative 40 degrees. The wind gusted at over 30 miles per hour. Going outdoors in such weather for any reason would be at best foolhardy and at worst deadly. So on that night, Ron was home inside his farmhouse located just outside the town of Center Point, Iowa. He had only the company of his three loyal golden retrievers, Ruff, Candy, and Crystal. There had been tentative plans for both a girlfriend and his best friend, Dale, to join him. Ron had expressed concern recently that he felt someone was watching him, and he was looking forward to welcoming some visitors that night. At approximately 8 p.m., Ron hung up from speaking with the girlfriend, and she was to be on her way over. When she tried to start her car, however, it wouldn't start. She went back inside to call him to let him know, but unfortunately, Ron didn't answer the phone. Ron's best friend, Dale, also tried to call to say that he couldn't get his car started, but again, no answer. Later, Dale told a newspaper reporter, quote, It's always bothered me that I didn't go out there that night. But if I had been there, would I have been able to prevent the murder, or would I have been lying there with Ron? When I think about this murder, all I see is darkness. The facts are clouded. The clues are few. And I don't know who to trust anymore. Ron, who was the youngest of seven siblings, was close with his family, and despite his desire for privacy, he had a large circle of friends and acquaintances in the Lynn County area. According to those who knew him, he was fun to be around and kind. Ron's older brother John lived just up the road, and it was John who unfortunately found Ron's body at about noon on December 24th. The scene he found was heartbreaking. Ron was lying face down on the floor of an unheated storage room, his body partly inside the room and blocking the door from closing. His hands had been tied behind his back with telephone cord. According to his death certificate, Ron had been savagely beaten with a golf club and two hammers. He'd been shot in the right bicep with a 22 caliber handgun. The bullet exited his bicep and entered his chest. These injuries, along with the freezing cold night that he was exposed to, are what caused Ron Novak's death. There were indications that Ron had been sitting in a chair while he was being beaten with the golf club and hammers. The storage room Ron was found in was the kind that you will find attached to the back of most older farmhouses, just off the kitchen's back door. The utility of this type of room was important to life on rural Midwestern farms built before HVAC. 
In snowy conditions, the room was used to keep firewood and other hardy items that needed to stay dry, but may have also been too dirty to bring in the house. So people would store coats, boots, tools, and at Ron's house, he did still store firewood in that room. In the storeroom with Ron's body when John arrived were Ron's three loyal dogs reportedly all curled up together trying to warm his frozen body and most likely trying to stay warm themselves. Information released by police was sparse, but they did tell the press a few important details. A violent struggle had taken place inside that room and Ron had been brutally attacked and overpowered by more than one person. In order to get his hands bound behind his back, it's been speculated that someone would have been able to accomplish this by merely threatening to shoot one or all of Ron's dogs. That may have been by far the easiest way to gain Ron's compliance, because Ron was six foot tall and 200 pounds. Once Ron was incapacitated, he didn't have a chance. He could no longer defend himself. Family believes Ron's dogs would have tried to protect him, but there's no information to indicate that any of the dogs were harmed. The dogs were not tested to see if they've been drugged. Who would be able to allow themselves to kill Ron, but couldn't bring themselves to kill the dogs? Lots of conjecture could be made about this facet of the story, and we'd be interested in your thoughts about it. There's an impressive body of known evidence that was present during the investigation, and some of it still exists today. But one of the pieces of evidence that regretfully was never saved were footprints that were in the snow outside of Ron's house, and also some footprints behind a tree as if someone was concealing themselves. Now, these footprints, due to the wind gusts that night, were covered up, but police could still see that they were there, and they could see where everyone had walked. No one preserved any of those footprints, and that's unfortunate because they could have proven to be invaluable in eliminating or identifying suspects. Over at the house, glass had been broken out of the kitchen door that led out to the storeroom, but the door itself was still locked, and there was a rifle propped up next to that door. This is why police believe that the killers did not gain access to the rest of the home. Indeed, the only thing that appeared to be missing from what they've released to the public was Ron's wallet, in which Ron had typically carried large amounts of cash. Police said they found no fingerprints. The only places dusted in the house were the storeroom area and the door frame of an upstairs closet. Inside the storeroom, we know they found the murder weapons, including the two hammers, a golf club, and a gun. That was the 22 caliber handgun. Later, police found the owner of that gun, but no information is available as to who that person is and how it came to be involved in a murder. Some of the other items police seized included a small suitcase filled with over $30,000 in cash, a duffel bag with over $7,000 worth of marijuana, and inside a closet, a strong box that contained another eighty dollars to $100,000 in cash, along with family keepsakes of personal worth to Ron. Ron's wallet was found sometime later in a Cedar Rapids neighborhood called Lincoln Way Village. It was only missing the money that had been inside. Family, searching themselves near Ron's house, found a bloody beer can tossed into a roadside ditch. Forensically, the only item known to have been tested for DNA is Ron's shirt. From what we could find out, it was tested in 2006. Present was the blood of an unknown person. They ran the profile through CODIS, but there was no match. As you might already suspect, Ron Novak, 24 years old, owner of a nice home and property, sold marijuana. In fact, he had one of, if not the largest marijuana sales enterprises in the area at the time. He'd been picked up by police in the past for possession with intent to distribute, and police had been watching him. So like many of our victims that we profile on this podcast, Ron was engaging in risky behavior. He had frequent contact with others who had few or no qualms about breaking the law, 
and maybe a bit naively, Ron might not have realized just how dangerous these people can be. Ron's business was thriving. He didn't even hide the suitcase with money or the duffel bag holding the marijuana. There can be little doubt that Ron would have been well known as a reliable source of weed, and it goes without saying that he would have also had large amounts of pot or cash or both at any given time. Living alone, isolated from those who might have otherwise seen or heard something suspicious, Ron was woefully unprepared to deal with anyone who, with a partner, had the motive to exploit this vulnerability. When I think back to myself at that age, I remember feeling invincible. I didn't fully understand what evil people were capable of, and I think most of us can recall times in our younger years when we wonder, what was I doing? What could I have been thinking? Well, Ron was only 24. He felt at home in his community and likely saw an opportunity to make some money. It could be as simple as that, and he may not have realized the danger until he began to actually experience the threats, such as when his house was burglarized not too long before his murder, and when he mentioned to others that he'd seen a car sitting parked outside his house all night, not long before the attack. Ron would have been wary of anyone who might have shown up at his house expressing a wish to purchase some weed, or maybe even someone pretending to have car trouble and asking to use Ron's phone. Were these the same people who'd been watching Ron? Ron was a definite financial threat to whoever his competition was. Also, he was a potential robbery target. So we have at least three types of individuals who had a motive to be watching Ron. We have the cops, we have competition, and we have criminal opportunists. If it had been just a local opportunist, maybe some customers, I get the feeling that someone would have at some point talked. Somebody walking around with extra money they didn't earn would have definitely raised some eyebrows in that small town or greater Lynn County. Also, they didn't bother to go after the real money. Perhaps they thought the hundreds of dollars in Ron's wallet was the real money. If it had been the competition, that is an expression of intent of someone who just wants the problem eliminated. They weren't foolhardy enough to steal over $30,000 of some other supplier's money because that could come back around in more serious ways than they needed. So maybe they just wanted Ron out of the picture. And if that's true, again, if police knew Ron was dealing, wouldn't they have known who else was dealing? Were they also watching them? Wouldn't they know who took Ron's place? It seems pretty simple if you can figure out who had the best motive to get rid of Ron. We were able to dig up several newspaper articles out of Lynn County about their local drug dealers getting busted as the investigation into Ron's death was still active. So we wonder if those dealers were ever questioned about what they may know about Ron's death, and if, years later, they were tracked down and asked for DNA samples. Those whose DNA wasn't already in CODIS by that time, of course. What new middleman took over Ron's place? Investigators initially had upwards of 40 suspects that they questioned, but they say they ran out of leads. They even considered one of Ron's brothers, Don, a suspect because he was apparently a drug addict. Don told the press that he felt he knew who did that to Ron, and according to Don, the act was carried out to eliminate Ron as competition. Along with that theory, some say Ron was only meant to be roughed up badly enough to stop dealing, but not killed. So the conjecture runs high on this case, but because Don had contacts in the drug dealing community of Lynn County, his information can't totally be discounted. Like we said before, the dogs were found with Ron's body. If they were found in the storeroom and the door to the kitchen was locked, there seems to be no possible way they would have been in the main house area during the attack. But people still insist that the reason the killers didn't make their way into the main house was because the dogs were in there barking. What seems more likely is that the killers ambushed Ron, fought with him, but finally tied his hands behind him, maybe using that threat of the gun, sat him in a chair, beat him badly, and shot him in his right arm. For what reason can be debated, but the dogs had to have either been in the storeroom or outside during this time. And if they're in the storeroom, 
they were probably trying to attack the killers. Since none of the dogs were reported to have been harmed, there's a good chance that their noise and aggression made spending more time at the farm impossible in the killers' minds. Already having a bloody fight with Ron, who was now shot, they may have panicked and left, taking Ron's wallet. Ron may have tried to walk a few paces towards the door, which is where he was later found. Another thing to note is that Ron was expecting at least two people, the woman he was dating and his friend Dale. Other people like dealers or associates may have made arrangements with Ron, so he might have been expecting them too. It's been said that Ron would not have opened the door to anyone he didn't know and expect. Police suggested the ambush may have happened using the excuse of a need to use the phone because of car trouble. But that doesn't make much sense if Ron's family is believed when they say he would not have opened the door for that. Ron knew there was a real possibility, maybe an inevitability, of a threat of some sort. We know he would have been capable of defending himself against one person, so the opportunity presented to the killers was a double-edged sword. While there was less of a chance of getting caught since the better part of the entire community were stuck at home, there's no doubt that it was a dangerous exercise due to the weather, road conditions, Ron's physical strength, and the dogs. It's hard to believe these were professionals, though, because of how terribly they botched the operation. They made so many mistakes, and if not for the ineffective investigatory techniques of law enforcement, this case would likely have been closed already. For example, the killers didn't cut the phone lines from the outside. Back then, if you were going to break into a person's house, you had one advantage over criminals today. You would cut the phone lines and thus make it impossible for your victim to contact anyone or even dial 911, since nobody had a cell phone back then. They were armed with just the gun and maybe the hammers. We know the golf club was Ron's and kept in the storeroom. Other people have said that that gun was actually loaned to Ron, so there's a chance the gun was taken away from him. Next, they failed to bring anything to tie Ron up with, so they had to find something there. Also, I wouldn't call this a mistake, but it does show a lack of criminal sophistication that they didn't shoot the dogs, who would have had to be at the very least in the way. Were they worried about the noise a gun makes? Well then, why were they not prepared for that contingency? There's little doubt that the killers did not know how to unlock the kitchen door and were unwilling or unable to get through the broken glass panel. We're asking a lot of questions, but that's because we have to wonder if police themselves asked them, or if they have the answers but haven't released that information. In fact, as I'm sure you can imagine, authorities have shared very little information with the public and with the family of Ron Novak, so there are few ways to tell what's been done from an investigative standpoint. This is, of course, incredibly frustrating for Ron's family, as it is for most victims' families when cases go cold and no progress is made, but their hands are in the same position as Ron's were on that night in 1983, because they have to wait for police to do something. They do not have the luxury of interviewing suspects, following up on leads, getting warrants, and asking for DNA samples. They can't do any of that. All they can do is sit around and wait while making public appeals for someone to come forward. Imagine how frustrating that must be for a sibling of Ron's when you see the news reports daily of people getting charged and convicted of murder for being a DNA match, but nobody does any testing on your brother's case for at least 10 years after DNA begins to be used as evidence in court. Patty Wilson, one of Ron's sisters, told a local news station last year, quote, I don't like to say they didn't do their work. I don't know if they did. I have no right to know. That's hard when you're the family of a victim. And Patty's not wrong. It's understandable when a case is being actively investigated, you have to be able to let the police do their jobs without compromising their work and their information. But when a case goes cold and all progress and work stops, what happens then? It reminds us of Randy Leach, where Randy's parents have fought for the same amount of time to get some information on the case so they can rest their minds that one rumor or another rumor 
has been properly investigated and cleared. They've been to court countless times, even gathered 12,000 signatures for a petition, and at every turn, they've been stonewalled. As you know, if you listen to that episode, they're now resorting to a GoFundMe campaign to continue searching for Randy, or for any facts, because over the years, they've spent everything they have on trying to find out something, whether it's hiring searching teams or attorneys. They don't even know how much they've spent at this point. It shouldn't be like that. This is why we have the Freedom of Information Act. Something must be done, because families like the Leeches and Ron Novak's loved ones deserve some answers, especially if it's been over 30 years. Advocates in the fight to bring Ron's killers to justice have been pushing the sheriff's office to use technology to help identify or eliminate potential suspects. They've been asking for them to utilize a new system called DNA phenotyping. Using the DNA, the lab generates a composite. This technology has been used many times already to solve cases and bring killers to justice, and it offers new hope for those decades-old cases. One such example is the case of Marcel Martenko. A Cedar Rapids teenager, Marcel's murder is also senseless and still unresolved. She was attacked in the parking lot area of a local mall where she had gone alone to purchase a coat. Michelle was a high school senior, beautiful and talented, and her murder devastated her family and shocked the entire Cedar Rapids community. When Michelle's body was found in her parents' car the next morning, December 20th, 1979, still parked at the mall, investigators were faced with a troubling mystery. Michelle had been stabbed repeatedly, the viciousness of the attack apparent by the multiple stab wounds to her face. Who would want to do something like this to such a well-liked, vibrant young lady? Michelle had fought hard to preserve her life, and in the process of the struggle, the killer left his blood somewhere on her body or in the car. Unfortunately, this fact was ignored for years until in 2006, a new detective sent it off for a DNA profile. It returned no matches in CODIS, so in 2017, they decided to try the snapshot phenotyping. It sparked a deluge of leads for Cedar Rapids investigators to follow up on, and the case is now being actively investigated again. This new tool has produced results in many cases, and we'd invite you to check it out. Recently, a killer in Brownwood, Texas, confessed to the brutal murder of Chante Blankenship, when he looked at a poster and saw his own face staring back at him, a face created by this phenotyping process. He hadn't even been a suspect, but when people in town saw that picture, the calls started flooding in because the community knew exactly who it was. Shantae's stepfather said, quote, We got justice for Shantae, and that's what we wanted. She can't be replaced, but we got somebody off the streets. I hope he fries. To the hardworking investigators at the Brown County, Texas Sheriff's Office who did what it took to get justice served, thank you. Ron's family and their supporters have requested that the Lynn County Sheriff's Office try this same technology. Since investigators already have a long list of potential suspects, there's a strong chance a phenotype snapshot could help eliminate more of them. And the very idea of making some progress, any progress on Ron's case, gave family hope. But it was not to be. The sheriff's office refused, citing budgetary constraints, and they used the flimsy and invalid excuse that they didn't have enough DNA to allow them to utilize that technology. This statement was made in 2017. So there are only two assumptions we could draw from this on-camera claim they made. Either it signifies a dismissal of the public's general knowledge of advancements in DNA forensic methods by assuming we don't know that the FBI has been using PCR for years, or perhaps the investigator himself doesn't know about it. If there's a chance he is in fact truly unaware of these not-so-new advancements, we'll include a link in our show notes. We're also going to include a link to information on the MVAC, which you might remember we discussed in episode 13, Allison Jackson Foy's case. The MVAC could not only yield more of the current killer's DNA, it could even offer the DNA of whoever else was attacking Ron that night, 
because they have the murder weapons. It's pretty clear the investigating on Ron Novak's case was minimal at best. Why wouldn't the sheriff's office want to clear this case once and for all? The family believes this is because Ron was a drug dealer, and they could very well be correct. Yet again, we have an example of local law enforcement exploiting the gift of discretion that the public has entrusted them with by choosing not to investigate a heinous murder and allowing a killer to walk free for over 30 years. A case should never be cold unless everything that can be done to find the murderer has been done. If there are suspects that need to be interviewed again, then that's what needs to happen. If DNA needs to be requested, request it. Nobody has asked the investigators to do anything they don't get paid to do. Ron's family deserves answers. Ron wasn't perfect and everybody knows that. At this point, while Ron does deserve justice, when police focus on their disdain for a victim, they forget about all the other victims that deserve justice. These victims are the family that suffers and the community whose safety is compromised by their refusal to work as hard as they would on a case of a sympathetic victim. With the amount of evidence, there's absolutely no reason this case shouldn't have been resolved years ago. Sometimes all it takes is for a lazy or arrogant investigator to be replaced. We've seen evidence of this, and what that tells us is that we need to start advocating as a community for results-based continued employment, compensation, and salary packages for criminal investigators. Another way to handle officers who refuse to work on a case that has open leads would be to address it by either transferring that officer to a position with the responsibility he or she can effectively handle, or, like the rest of us who work in private industry, by losing their job. There are plenty of cases we could cite to validate this necessity for monitoring case management. Dylan Redwine is a good example. Between 2015 and 2017, there was no new evidence. The case had stalled because the sheriff and the DA were both uninterested in working hard to get it resolved. The community wasn't having it. A killer was walking among them, and they didn't appreciate that. So they got rid of that sheriff, and they also got a new DA. Lo and behold, a grand jury was convened and an indictment was brought. Dylan's accused killer, his own father, is now awaiting trial. In another case, all it took was some brief research and possibly a few phone calls after a detective decided to try to get answers for the family, that is. It was the case of Edward Perez in Tulare County, California. Edward was killed when he attempted to break up a confrontation going on between two of his neighbors. One of the neighbors, Antonio Morales Zamora, pulled out a gun and shot Edward. Everybody knew who did it, but Zamora was able to evade authorities and make his way to Mexico. So investigators forgot about the case until August of 2017. Detective Chris Dempsey decided to give it some honest attention. Dempsey found, through simple social media searches, where Zamora had been, that Zamora had recently passed away in Tijuana, Mexico. At least the family had some answers, and if closure is what they wanted, Dempsey did what he could to provide that. And finally, I think a great example of what can happen when a case gets turned over to new people is the murder of Sherry Rasmussen. For decades, it was assumed by the LAPD that Sherry was attacked in her home during a botched burglary. They had no idea who it could be. Well, it turned out that a single swab from where the killer had bitten Sherry had been misplaced. So over 20 years later, a cold case detective going through the case searched for it. It had gotten left in a freezer years ago, and it was never tested. Finally, they submitted this sample for DNA sequencing. And when it came back, they ran it through CODIS. Like Ron's case, there were no hits, unfortunately. But what they did find out was that it revealed the attacker was not some random burglar type. It was a woman who bit Sherry. Who would want to hurt Sherry? They had no suspects that were female, only men. So the case was again shelved. A few years later, another cold case detective pulled the file and began to honestly consider the possibilities. Sherry's husband had an ex-girlfriend who had been harassing Sherry. 
But that woman wasn't investigated at all. That woman was now, years later, a detective for the LAPD. The cold case detectives worked hard to get Stephanie Lazarus to provide a DNA sample, pleading with her, even telling her they needed to eliminate her. But they had no luck because Stephanie lawyered up immediately. So, like a scene from a movie, they followed her around one day, and when she threw away a cup she'd been drinking out of, they retrieved it from the garbage can along with the straw. Her DNA turned out to be a match to the original biter's DNA. Eventually, Stephanie, former detective of the LAPD, was sentenced to 27 years in prison for the murder of Sherry Rasmussen. I use these cases to show what can be done when a detective is determined to get an investigation back on track. Perform their due diligence so the department can truthfully say to the victim's family and to us, the community, we are doing everything we can to solve this case. This is what we pay taxes for. This is the discretion we entrust to law enforcement and we expect as a community nothing less than their very, very best every day. If they don't want to do that, we need to work to replace them with folks who are willing to do their jobs like the folk we just heard about. As always, we're going to include relevant links to Ron's case in the show notes. Check out our website, caseacquaint.com, if you want to learn more not only about Ron's case, but all the other cases we briefly mentioned today. It's absolutely a wonderful thing to see good police work, and it gives us hope. Now, Ron's family has not given up. We want to invite you to engage in helping by sharing Ron's story and learning more by checking out a Facebook page that was created to affect a positive outcome for this 24-year-old murder victim who was doing nothing but selling pot. It's called Ron Novak Unsolved Homicide 1983, and it's a Facebook page. There's a dedicated group of family, friends, and supporters who need your help. Do you know who killed Ron Novak? If you have any information that might help, Crime Stoppers has a $2,500 reward for you. They can be reached at 1-800-272-7463. I'd like to thank Marlene Florang Sharmosta, who is administrator for the Advocacy Facebook page that we just mentioned. Thank you, Marlene, for providing us with some of the information that we needed in order to tell Ron's story. Marlene actually wrote a news story about Ronnie. It's called, Who Killed Ronnie Novak? Someone Must Know. And it appeared in the newspaper, The Gazette. We'll link that article as well if you're interested in reading it. We hope you enjoyed this episode today. Please, if you have a minute, share this episode however you accessed it on your social media so that other people can engage if they're interested in helping Ron's family and friends bring his killer to justice. I want to thank you for listening, and we will talk again next week.